Welcome to the 700 Club. Today we have one of the most dramatic miracles I have ever seen. That's going to be coming up later on the program. We're going to be praying with you. Uh, but before that, let's deal with the top news. Here's Kidnapped in Haiti. A Catholic priest now reveals what happened to him last April. He was taken at the hands of the same notorious gang that abducted 17 missionaries a month ago. So how did his faith sustain this Haitian priest and what finally led to his release? He spoke with George Thomas about his terrifying ordeal in the CBN News exclusive interview. On April 11th, Catholic priest Jean Niques Millian, along with nine other priests and nuns, were on their way to install a fellow church member as leader of a new parish. When they reached on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince, more than a dozen heavily armed gang members stopped their vehicle. I was kidnapped. Millian tells CBN News that the 400 Mawozo gang, the same group behind the October kidnappings of 17 missionaries, also abducted him. What did they demand from you? They demand uh, money. How much? One million. One million U.S. dollars? One million dollars. One million dollars per person, the same amount they demanded for the 16 Americans and one Canadian kidnapped last month after visiting a Haitian orphanage. A U.S. government official tells Reuters they have evidence that some of the missionaries are still alive. My faith helped me a lot. Millian says the gang, made up of mostly young men and teenagers, would move them around to several locations. Often blindfolded, they slept on floors and had little to eat. Millian said he and the others drew strength from prayer times. They had one Bible, which they would read when guards weren't around. We said uh, a moment of prayer in the morning, a moment of prayer in the midday, and a moment of prayer during the night. Millian's moment of freedom came 20 days later, after his parish paid an undisclosed ransom amount to the gang. This week, Millian led mass at his church in Port-au-Prince and urged congregants to pray for the safe release of the 17 missionaries. A leader of the Mawozo gang has threatened to kill the missionaries if their ransom demands aren't met. I ask every friend of mine to pray for the American people and the Canadian one. George Thomas, CBN News. Well, please continue to pray for those 17 brave souls who have been kidnapped. Their lives are at risk. Uh, the, the deterioration of things in Haiti is absolutely stunning. Uh, from the earthquake back in 2009 to today, it just seems to be hopeless there. But there's always hope with God. So let us pray and let's believe that he can do the impossible. Here at home, we've got other problems. Inflation is up and President Biden's poll numbers are down. Rising prices have become a major political headache for the president and the sticker shock won't be over anytime soon. Well, here's Jennifer Wishon with more. Millions of Americans are looking forward to hosting Thanksgiving dinner, but inflation is becoming an unwelcome house guest, putting a strain on the festivities. And it's not just the rising cost of turkey and pie hurting family budgets. This week, the Consumer Price Index, which keeps track of what people are paying, jumped 6.2 percent from a year ago, marking the highest level since 1990. It's a ripple effect, and um, that really puts a challenge as we go into the holiday season. A CNBC survey shows inflation now ties with coronavirus as the biggest concern facing Americans. And it's punching the president politically. Republicans were hitting the president hard even before this week's report showed inflation heading even higher. We have a raging inflation as bad, some would argue, as back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. It's a direct result, he says, of flooding the country with money through President Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan earlier this year. The president says the infrastructure plan passed this week will help alleviate bottlenecks in the supply chain. And thanks to those steps we're taking, very soon we're going to see the supply chain start catching up with demand. But critics say the president's policies are the problem, like cutting back on the U.S. supply of fuel. He shuts down American pipelines but allow Putin 
to have his own pipeline. Today, a gallon of regular costs $3.41, up more than a dollar from a year ago. And as winter approaches, the Energy Department estimates heating bills will be up as much as 54 percent. Going to be up there probably at least $500 more this year, so they, they should plan on that. And while some blame the supply chain problems for inflation, others point out that Europe has those supply chain issues too, but without inflation. Instead, many point to government spending. Democratic economist Larry Summers warned in February that the Democrats' COVID relief plan could lead to inflation. He was blasted by the White House, which called inflation transitory. Now some economists say it could easily last another year. President Obama's top economic advisor, Jason Furman, says inflation is not slowing. It's maintaining a red-hot pace. And now as the president and Democrats work to infuse nearly $2 trillion into the economy through his Build Back Better bill, they're facing more political roadblocks. As Senator Joe Manchin signals concerns new federal spending may make inflation worse. Americans do know the pain because even though salaries are up, prices are up even higher, which means people are falling behind. Some economists and business leaders are looking to the Federal Reserve to do more to slow inflation, but that could mean multiple hikes in interest rates, which could hurt the economy. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Well, those projected multiple hikes in interest rates will absolutely hurt the economy. That will change every variable rate interest loan there is. It will absolutely impact the housing market because it will make it more expensive to, to pay a monthly payment uh, for a house. So we're looking at rising inflation, and it looks like it's here. The administration just this past summer was saying this is transitory. It's going to be over soon. Uh, they keep talking about supply chain, but they're not talking about the stimulus packages and how printing money always leads to inflation. That's been in every single economy since there was money. Uh, so when you're printing this amount of money under this new money theory, uh, they seem to conveniently ignore, well, that's going to put inflationary pressure on everything. The stimulus packages have actually encouraged people uh, to stay home. And they haven't encouraged work, industry, uh, savings, all of those things. And it's this huge demand that's been pumped up because the government is printing money. So instead of Build Back Better, what we're doing is building inflation. If you think Build Back Better is some kind of new political uh, slogan, here's what former President Bill Clinton said after he was appointed special United, States, United Nations envoy for Haiti back in 2009. The second part of our mandate is to ensure the recovery effort has the assistance with the level of commitment we had when I did this work for the UN in the tsunami affected areas. Our goal is to build back better, better schools, hospitals and housing, better public facilities and infrastructure, and much more effective disaster prevention and mitigation. Well, the plan back in 2009 was to build back better and to assist in the recovery effort. Haiti had had this massive earthquake, and how do we build back roads? How do we build back infrastructure? How do we build back hospitals, schools? How do we build back a nation? And the answer was, well, we need more spending. Uh, the UN threw money at it. Uh, the Clinton Foundation raised a lot of money for it. But here we are 12 years later, and our first story today was all about kidnapping gangs in Haiti, how lawlessness is now everywhere. The economy is essentially non-existent. Employment is essentially non-existent. And so we can see Build Back Better didn't build back anything. So why do we think it's going to work here in the United States? What do we need to be focused on? And uh, for me, we need to be focused on how do we build better families? Those are the fundamental building blocks of every successful culture in the history of the world. When you get away from family, when you get away from stable families generationally, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when you lose that generational continuity, you've essentially lost everything. Haiti is a prime example. The Dominican Republic, right next door, 
It didn't get a Build Back Better program, and today it's a whole lot better than Haiti. Political polarization, racial tension, and combative viewpoints on hot-button issues are leaving Americans more divided than ever. So what will it take to unite our splintered nation? Take a look. If America is indeed a melting pot, it may be time to replace the pan. The notion of mixing and celebrating different ideas, ethnicities, and cultures, now charred by tribalism, Jews will not replace us. outrage, and suspicion. The result, upended families, friends, and neighbors. Happy and even splintered congregations called to worship together. An October Pew survey of nearly 20,000 people across more than a dozen nations rates the United States as the most divided society, especially on race and politics. During the riots and national unrest earlier this year, the Lord spoke to my heart saying, bring my people together. Author, educator, entrepreneur, and pastor of one of the fastest growing churches in America, Dr. Derek Greer believes the Bible holds the key. Comparing the current crisis to ancient Israel's hopelessness, as told in the Old Testament book of Malachi. It was not a prayer meeting or a great demonstration of God's supernatural power that changed the nation. According to Malachi, the climate changed when the people of God finally began to talk to each other. Imagine what might happen today if those who truly love the Lord would find the time and the courage to talk to one another. With a new initiative called Let's Talk, Bishop Greer is calling on Christians to get out of their comfort zones and start having honest and frank dialogue about what divides us, to listen and learn from one another, and ultimately bring healing and racial reconciliation to the church. It's a biblical roadmap, Greer says, for the church to model to society based on a simple premise. It's time for us to have a conversation. America, it's time for us to talk. Well, Bishop Derek Greer joins us now from our Washington, D.C. studios. And Bishop, it's great to have you on the program. Great to be with you, Gordon, and uh, I salute you for participating in this effort. Uh, you, you, you did a great interview with me weeks ago, and it looks like I get a chance to be interviewed by you. Right. And looking forward to speaking with you this morning. All right, turn around, turn around, fair play. All right, let's talk about 11 o'clock Sunday morning. Uh, it's been described yes. as the most segregated hour in America, and Jesus yeah. wanted us to be one. So, how can we have our churches uh, have a biblical picture of unity? If we're, uh, if, in, in, how do we change that division that's currently in our pews? Yeah, it's first a heart issue, Gordon. Uh, you know, we can uh, do, do our best to uh, uh, try to come up with programs and plans, but uh, reconciliation really begins with people wanting to be reconciled one to another. And uh, uh, it all begins in the heart. So our goal here is not just to come up with another program, it's to get people talking. So today, you know, we all live in very siloed universes where, uh, you know, all day long we listen to people who agree with us largely, people that support our positions. And over time, what happens is we become desensitized to people with different perspectives. And uh, what's vital today is that we get in a room one with another and begin to talk to each other, not at each other, not past each other, but talk to each other. And that's the goal of uh, Let's Talk. Okay, well, let's talk about the spiritual inspiration. You got a, a verse from Malachi, chapter 3, verse yeah. 16. Let, let yeah. me read it for yeah. you. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one yeah. another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. So how, how do we start this conversation? Beautiful question. Um, you know, when people have conflicts and relationships, it's typically four tried and, and true approaches to resolving them. And they're all biblical. Number one, admit you have a problem. Number two, uh, sympathize uh, with those that have been wounded uh, empathize even better. Uh, third, uh, began to, you know, make make changes and, and, and stop doing what, what has been done in the past. And then third, move on with the relationship. With that, um, 
The first part of the Let's Talk campaign has been a statement of change. We are admitting we have a problem. We have a serious problem. It's going on for a while. It begins with admitting. But from there, uh, we move to the banquet where we're going to have multicultural leaders from across the country um, participate uh, in a meal, uh, which is very biblical as well, at the Museum of the Bible, where we're going to hear people's stories uh, about what life is like in their skin, white people, black people, Hispanic pl people. Actually, a wonderful Asian lady is uh, uh, emceeing the event. So we're going to have very uh, different perspectives in the room. Uh, but you know, what we want to do is bring down the walls. People can argue ideas, but you can't argue a personal story. So what we're going to have is people, again, sharing. Uh, we have immigrants that will be in the room. We have folks born in the United States of America. So uh, hopefully, as people share their stories, walls come down. So the first step is to admit, and that's what the statement of change is about. But the second step is to begin to empathize. And you can't empathize if you haven't heard. So we're going to share our personal Stories. Then from there, we will transition to a national um, uh, Zoom call every month uh, where national leaders, pastors, and, and heads of ministries will come together and have conversations. So what will happen is at the beginning of the call, there'll be a 15-minute presentation. But the rest of the call, the pastors and ministers will be placed into small groups and begin to talk through issues that divide. And our hope is that in those conversations, solutions begin to emerge and relationships begin to build. But back to Malachi 3 and 16, uh, it's important for us to pray. Uh, it's, it's important uh, for us to invite the sovereign hand of God. But what resolved the issues in the book of Malachi, and, and, and at that time, is very similar to our time, is cynicism and, and frustration. Uh, the church was at a super low ebb at that point. Uh, but what happened or what resolved the issue was the people stopped talking past each other. They, the, those who feared the Lord, I mean, people who loved Jesus, if you will. I know this was before Christ uh, had come, but people who loved the Lord uh, started having conversation, and God honored that. So the first step to us getting past where we are is us having a conversation and the world's doing it. Uh, but as Christians, we need to become leaders in this. We need to model this and we need to talk through our issues. Well, let's talk about the kickoff event, the, um, the yeah. banquet at the Museum of the Bible. It's not just yes. for the people in the room. You're going yes. online with it. So tell us how yes. people can participate at home. Yes, uh, on November 17th, uh, from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, you can live stream. Uh, go to letstalklive.org. That's letstalklive.org. Uh, also, uh, you can go to letstalklive.org uh, to sign the statement of change. It's really vital that we admit we have an issue. And then from there, I really want to recommend that pastors and ministry leaders go to letstalklive.org and register for the monthly phone call. Um, you know, we're not going to resolve these issues in little silos. We're going to have to come together and try to talk through and love through. And there will be some frustration, I'm sure, on the phone calls. But I'm hoping there will also be some joy as people grow and learn together. But again, uh, praying in a room privately is not the same as having a conversation with someone you love. We pray before we talk, but we have to talk. So let's talk, America. Okay. After these... Um talks, you're also going to be having facilitators and training yes. facilitators. So tell us about that. Yes. So when the pastors and ministry leaders are placed in small groups, uh, there will be a facilitator that will guide the conversation. And uh, these are our ministry leaders from across the country. Uh, there are some uh, business people that will also be uh, helping to guide the conversation. Uh, but it's, it's all about trying to keep the conversations on the rails. And uh, those facilitators are a super important part of what we're doing. But also, again, I want to encourage those viewing, um, encourage your pastor to get involved. It's one thing to talk about it, you know, to people that agree with you. It's another thing to get eyeball to eyeball with someone that perhaps has a different experience. And uh, even with you, Gordon, I'm delighted by your participation because we have people from various backgrounds, various perspectives all leading in this effort. And the common denominator is we all love the Lord Jesus and we love the church of Jesus Christ. So I just want to encourage people to get involved. I'll just add to that. I want to see heaven here on earth. When I see heaven, I see every tribe. I see every nation. 
I see every single person race represented before the throne of the Lamb, and they're all giving worship simultaneously to him. That is what I want to see. I want to see that not just in heaven. It would be wonderful if we could see that right here on earth. Uh, we yes. could have a huge breakthrough in our nation uh, around the world and let the church take the lead on this. Uh, let's be at the forefront of racial reconciliation uh, because in heaven, we're going to have a whole lot of it. So let's have a whole lot of it right here on earth. Bishop, thank you for being with us. And if you want to have more information at home about Let's Talk, how you can get involved, how you can get your pastor involved, how you can get your church involved, uh, just go to cbnnews.com. Well, this holiday season, we'd like to be a part of your celebration. So we prepared some special features just for you on cbnfamily.com. And as you plan your Thanksgiving meal, be sure to watch the, uh, we have this new recipe, uh, app caramel. Uh, some say caramel. Caramel. Yeah. 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 Ashley says caramel. Caramel <laughs> yeah. apple pie, which she, I guess, recommends. Um, I, I highly recommend. It's quite delicious. All right. Yes. And it's we really got a turkey good. brine recipe. We do. We, we do also have. have some Christmas music. So we've got other things, Christmas movies for you and your whole family, Superbook. So if you want to join us, just go to cbnfamily.com or you can download the CBN Family app to your smart TV or device and you can cook cookies with Ashley. That's right. And there, it's an easy recipe. It's a really easy one. <laughs> you, would you recommend it? It, it's it's all <laughs> prepackaged. It's not from scratch. It's, it's, pre, it's Pillsbury no. dough, but it's a fun experience. You know, you just decorate. You can do it with your kids, your niece or nephew, your friends. It's great. So if you want more, just go to CBN. But if you want a made from scratch apple pie, now you're talking. Now we're talking. That was quite delicious. Highly recommend that. Was and it is, better than the cookie? I would say yes, but if you're okay. looking to decorate cookies, I would say go with that. You know, if you're going to a cookie swap party or something, the cookie recipe is good for that. So. All right. All right. Let's talk miracles. Yes, yes. All right. Well, his arms looked like sticks. Massive tumors protruded all over his body, and doctors could do nothing to cure him. Tom was told to make the best of the time he had left. Then he was sent home to die. So why is he still alive 25 years later? Well, you're about to find out. Shock, fear, fear of the unknown. You don't know what to say. There is nothing you can say. It was like our world just stopped. In 1996, Tom and Sid Renfro were living comfortable lives in their small town of Coburn in the Virginia mountains. Tom was a well-respected physician and had a thriving medical practice. Life was good until December of that year when Tom was diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma, a very rare aggressive cancer already in its final stage. There was no cure. At 41 years old, Tom was told he had just a few months to live. What is my family going to do? How am I going to provide for my family? What are we anticipating? What are we going to be going through? His oncologist said chemotherapy would only prolong the inevitable and the side effects would impair his quality of life. He was saying, you've got a limited amount of time and I want you to make the best of what time you have left before the ravages of this disease gets hold of you. Tom and Sid decided to forego the treatment and stand on their faith and believe God for a miracle. I knew I had reached the maximum the medicine had to offer. But as a Christian and a man that was walking in faith, I knew that I had not reached the limits of God. As the cancer ravaged Tom's body over the next several months, trusting and believing wasn't always easy. I would feel the tumors. They weren't getting smaller, they were getting bigger. And despair would set in. I'm getting worse and not better. And the way I would counteract that is I would pull the scriptures out. And the more I spent thinking on the words of God, the less the despair and the worry, the frustration had on me. I had to rely on God. I had to rely on the scriptures I had hidden in my heart. Either we trust or we don't. And I had to trust. 
they weren't the only ones asking God for a miracle. By now, thousands of people throughout the region were storming heaven in prayer, especially their own church family. And I would call and I'd say, I don't see how he can live if God doesn't help him right now. Many nights they went all night. I had people around me saying, look, Tom, we're standing in faith. We serve a God that's unlimited in power and ability. We want you to continue to hold on in faith because I'm believing. Sid even told me, I get up every morning expecting the Lord to heal you. Tom's condition rapidly deteriorated. Doctors believed his death was just days away. With Christmas approaching, they administered chemo, hoping it would buy time for Tom to spend the holidays with his family. Immediately, right before their eyes, a miracle unfolded. I noticed that the tumors on my neck had softened, and it wasn't happening just here, it was under my arms. And then they started shrinking, and life, it just flooded into me, where there was weakness and there was worry. Now there was, there was hope, there was joy, there was anticipation. And good things would come. Tom went back to his practice and would lead a full and happy life with Sid. And the cancer, it never returned. Over the years, Tom and Sid have rarely missed an opportunity to tell their story. In fact, Tom recently wrote a book about his miraculous journey and God's healing power. I wrote Avenues of Healing, Reaching for the Healing Power of God to equip people with understanding of what's going on, what the enemy is trying to do, where sickness and disease comes from, and to encourage people on getting into the presence of God. Words cannot express my gratitude to the Lord. It's changed the way I look at things. It's changed my understanding of my role as a physician. And I can see things in a little bit different light that, that brings greater joy and understanding to me compared to where I was before this illness hit my life. Wow. <laughs> I mean, some stories you just have no words. I mean, look at that. Here's Tom, who is a doctor who believes in the power of medicine. But even more than that, he believes in the healing power of the Lord Jesus. Just do what Tom did today. Whatever you're struggling with, refuse to bow down to the symptoms that are screaming in your ear, that are screaming in your mind. Refuse to bow down to that and believe, choose, change your thinking, turn and focus your mind on the promises of God, which are yes and amen for those who are in Christ Jesus. If that encouraged you in your faith, here are some more amazing miracles and answer to prayer. This is Donna of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She lost hearing in her right ear. When she was watching the 700 Club on November 8th, 2021, so this week, she heard Gordon say, someone else, you have problems with hearing in your right ear. God just opened that ear. There has been some discharge and other things associated with that. God is able to clear it out now and give you perfect hearing in that ear. Immediately, Donna's hearing was completely restored. Amen. Amen. That's a miracle. The deaf hear. Here's another one. Several months ago, Shirley of Easley, South Carolina, started experiencing pain in her left hip. It got so bad she could hardly stand up while channel surfing. Isn't that amazing? Channel surfing still happens today. Mm -hmm. Shirley happened upon the 700 Club. She heard Ashley say, someone with hip dysplasia in your left hip. God is healing that right now. Just receive that healing. Well, by faith, Shirley placed her hand on her hip and believed. She is now able to stand without any pain. Mm -hmm. You've seen some incredible stories. Here's someone with cancer. Doctors say uh, to a doctor, uh, get your affairs in order. Uh, you're not going to make it through this. Here's someone with no hearing in their right ear, gets hearing. Here's someone with hip dysplasia, difficulty walking, gets completely healed. How do you explain these things? These are miracles. Miracles still happen today. God still moves today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he's done for others, he will do for you because he wants to do it for you. 
He loves you. He loves you tenderly, completely, so much so he was willing to die for you. So whatever you've got, whatever the problem, whatever the need, let's together bring it to Jesus. And he's the answer to every human need. And he says to us, when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So Ashley and I are going to be your two or more. All you have to do is agree. And I encourage people to act faith. One of the ways you can act faith is to lay a hand on that area of the body that needs healing. It's real simple. God's just looking for a little bit. He's just looking for a mustard seed. So just in that mustard seed, lay a hand on it. We'll agree. You touch. We agree. God do, does all the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we lift everyone in the audience with pain, anyone with cancer, anyone with an infirmity, anyone who has problems seeing, hearing, tasting, swallowing, anyone with problems with digestion, anyone with problems with bearing children, mm. anyone who is lonely, Lord God, anyone in financial need. We just declare you are the answer to every human need. And we come to you boldly. We come to you in faith in the Messiah, the chosen one, the anointed one of God. We open our arms to you and we ask that you come and you heal and you be with us now. Be Emmanuel, God with us. As someone, you have a very painful right shoulder. It's very difficult for you to even move ever so slightly. It's just uh, incredible pain. God is healing that shoulder for you right now. You just felt it move back into place. Uh, all of those twinges are, are leaving you right now. What you couldn't do before, just raise that right arm to him and just begin to thank him for that incredible healing, restoration, all the tendons, everything is going to be fine, all the rotators and all the muscles, everything is fine and healed for you right now in Jesus' name. Ashley? Yeah, there's a gentleman watching. It's You have an a, 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 a odd condition with your right eye, and it's almost as if there's like a scale or a film over your eye, and it's very difficult for you to see. It's very, um, it's really upset you because you think you're going to go blind. No, Jesus is healing that for you right now, almost in Scripture where Paul was, the scales fell off his eyes. That is happening for you right now in Jesus' name. Just receive it. You're going to be able to see like you have been before in Jesus' name. Uh, someone, you have this uh, unusual um, where your the hair on your head is falling out in patches, uh, and you have patches where it's um, almost like this um, scaly, uh, but the hair is falling out, and other patches where everything's fine. God is healing your skin; He's healing the hairs of your head, and He's going to give you full restoration. Mm -hmm. Just raise your hands to Him. You've been embarrassed by it. You don't want to be in public and people stare and, and God's restoring everything to you. All that worry, everything, just give it all to him. Give it all to him and he's healing you right now. There's a woman watching. It's your left, uh, lower left side of your back. I believe it's sciatica. Um, the Lord is healing that for you right now. It's very stiff. You're not able to really move a whole lot. You've been praying for a release. Here it is. Receive it in Jesus name. So else, you had a, a, a crush injury to your nose. Your nose was broken, but it was crushed in, and it's created airway problems, difficulty breathing for you, difficulty sleeping. God is healing all of that. He's restoring your airway now in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you've been healed, let us know. Give your good report, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. All I have to do is pick up the phone, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome to Washington for the CBN News Break. The Pentagon says it's closely watching Russian military actions, including a buildup of troops near the border of Ukraine. What we uh, continue to see is um, 
unusual military activity inside Russia, but near Ukraine's borders. Um, and we remain concerned about that. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the United States knows Russia's playbook, referring to its move into Ukraine back in 2014. The Biden administration says it is committed to protecting Ukraine. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping those who are facing difficult financial situations with gifts of food. Joanne is an industrious worker who lost both of her jobs in her small North Carolina town after COVID hit. While looking for work, her finances got tight. Then, thanks to ministry partners, uh, a blessing came at just the right time. Joanne heard of Empowerment Temple, an Operation Blessing Food to Freedom partner in her town. Empowerment Temple receives monthly truckloads of groceries to distribute throughout the community to help with hunger relief. Joanne got the ample food she needed to help her through the rough times. And she said, what you all do makes a great difference, and it is a blessing. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Rock bottom, that's where Keith and Carrie Kemp thought they had landed when they were forced to move to a trailer. Then things went from bad to worse, and their trailer was repossessed. What happened next, and how did it lead to a financial miracle? Take a look. Keith and Terry Kemp love spending time together on their farm. In 1996, the Kemps ran the largest construction company in Okaloosa County. When you've done something and the people really love it, and you know, that satisfaction you get from thrilling them and giving them what, what they were asking for, that's always the best thing. In 2000, they began building spec homes for a real estate company that pushed them to build more homes than they budgeted. Keith believed he could deliver. We were booming so much that he just planned that we would sell that many homes. So he just borrowed the money and, you know, and built all those homes, but they just didn't sell. The market just dropped. We didn't have enough money in the bank to pull us on through until they were sold. The unsold homes were eventually repossessed and caused the Kemps to shut down their business. Keith began subcontracting with other companies, but the money he earned wasn't enough to cover all their expenses. They soon lost their home, vehicles, and were forced to move into a trailer on an empty lot owned by a friend. But that too was repossessed. When they were gonna repossess the trailer, Keith started throwing this house together with um, a few of our friends and um, it wasn't even finished when we had to move into it when they took the trailer. We didn't have stairs at the front door. We had plywood floors down. Our drywall wasn't done on the walls. I mean, um, it was very, very unfinished. And we had to live in that and finish it as we went. Oh, I felt terrible because, uh, you know, I've always been able to supply for my family. When I'm struggling to try to figure out where we're gonna make the money and how, I'm gonna take care of my wife and kids. That hurts you. Terry was a 700 Club viewer, and soon Keith began to watch it as well. There, he learned about tithing. Watching the 700 Club and Keith seeing the money miracles that happened once the people started tithing. Some of them didn't even have money to buy food with, but they gave their last $5. And then stuff just started happening to them. So I said, Keith, God said, God cannot lie. God said, give me 10%. And he, and he would give you that tenfold over. I'm like, he can't lie. I said, just test him. Test him, Keith, test him. I thought she was crazy. She'd always been wanting to tithe. And me, oh. They ain't getting my money, <laughs> so I wouldn't do this. But as things got bad, and the more I started watching the 700 Club, then, you know, I finally agreed. Keith and Terry began tithing to their church. They also started giving to CBN. Before long, they saw God begin to move in their finances when Terry noticed a deposit in her bank account that she didn't make. I went to the bank and I told them this money's in there and it's not mine. And they're like, yes, ma'am, it is. I was like, no, it's not. Only one check gets deposited in here. They're like, yes, ma'am, it is your money. I said, well, then I'll take every bit of it. The Kemps continued to tithe faithfully. Then Keith started receiving multiple construction jobs. As their income increased, so did their giving to CBN. I was convinced, you know, that if, if it's going to be there when you need it, you, you might as well help out as many people as you can. Today, the camps are back in business. Keith's income has doubled, and they're now debt-free. 
They've also finished building their house, and they know without a doubt that God blesses those that are faithful in their giving. Just try it. I think anybody that tries it could do it for a year, and if they ain't noticed that things are going better for them, I'll be totally shocked. I encourage everyone to tithe. I'm telling you, if you would tithe, you will see a miracle. Take Keith's challenge, do it for a year and see what happens to you. It's not some heavenly lottery, slot machine, anything like that. It's not an on again, off again thing. But when you say, I'm committed to giving, uh, wonderful things start to happen and they're really inexplicable. How do you explain the story you just saw? That's a financial miracle. And it all started when they put the principle into practice. Just like we lay hands on the sick, if you want to see a financial increase in your life, believe in tithing. And it's when you give, it will be given back to you. And these blessings come in unusual ways, and they're unusual blessings. Uh, but what you just saw can happen if you just follow the same principle. So if you want to start doing that, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, yeah, I want to be part of the 700 Club. I know you guys are a whole lot more than a TV show. You want to help people here in America. You want to help people around the world. We're preaching the gospel in over 70 languages. We're doing that through regional centers around the world where we're training local Christians how to do Christian television in their language. You're a part of all of it when you join with us. So if that's you, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Well, Barry Abernathy's adopted son, Tyler, may not have his dad's eyes, but he does have his hand. In fact, it's why Tyler called Barry his father when he first saw him. So why was Tyler so convinced? See for yourself. I've never had a thought of, uh, before all this happened, never had a thought of, uh, raising young kids at 50 plus years old. You know, that never had crossed my mind. Barry and Beverly Abernathy had already raised two daughters into their teen years when their older daughter, Chastity, came home from work at a daycare center, excited about two foster children. She came in one day talking about these children and she said, Daddy, the little boy, she said, you're just not gonna believe it. She said, he's got a hand exactly like your hand. And she said, this is exactly like yours. Barry was born missing most of his fingers on his left hand. Still, he's a two-time Grammy-nominated banjo player and singer with the group Appalachian Roadshow. Chastity knew the kids were struggling and pleaded with her parents to help. I called my mom first and I sent her a picture of Tyler and she said, Chastity, you're crazy. Cause I mean, I had the tendency to call her about kids before, but I was like, mama, this time's different. You gotta, you gotta come meet him at least. And she just let it go. And I told my daddy and he said, you are crazy. And I said, well, honey, there's no way. I mean, we, we're not fosters. We, it takes, you know, months of classes and, and you gotta, you gotta get educated on how to handle foster kids. And, and we're not even prepared. The siblings, Tyler and Zoe, had already been through eight different foster homes in the last two years. Beverly was reluctant to get emotionally involved. I work in the court system and I see these kind of things happen, like kids placed in foster homes and everything. And I was like, I will never get that attached. I tried to like stay away from it, keep it separate from our life. I was really crying because I felt so strongly about it because I'd met them and I knew if they had met them that they'd feel the same feeling I did. It was just a drawing towards them, both of them. A few weeks later, Barry was leaving town for a concert. Before driving off, he felt prompted to stop by the daycare center to meet the kids. Uh, the little boy, Tyler, was the first one I seen. He was in, in uh, a class, and they were kids were out playing. He was sitting at a little bench, table-like thing with one of his friends. And my daughter, Chastity, had shown him me playing uh, I, I, the Dance, Dance, Dance video uh, of uh, Appalachian Roadshow where I was playing the banjo with no fingers. Well, he had never seen, he had never known a dad, had, had, had a dad and uh, he had never seen anybody with a hand like his. So he immediately, to my dismay, he immediately thought I was his dad. So he looks up and he, his eyes like that, and he reaches over and he gets his little buddy and pats him on top of the head and he said, hey, look, that's my dad. And he jumps up out of his chair and he starts running to me and he just runs and just, I was standing there and he just jumps up and grabs a hold of me. So I pulled him on up and he grabbed me and he grabbed my face and he looked back like this and he said, Are you my dad? And I said, 
<laughs> I just kind of froze, you know, I didn't know what to say. And he said, you my dad. And he reached up, he kissed me on the cheek, and he patted me, and it was touching. I mean, it was very, very touching. Barry then found out Beverly had also felt drawn to the kids. He called me, and he's like, I went and saw the kids, and I said, well, I did too. And he's like, Phew. he's like, what do you think? And I said, I really don't know what to think. She said, do you think we're going we're to need to do something? I said, well, what can we do? We're not foster parents. There's nothing we can do. Things weren't working out with the current foster family, so the Abernathys arranged to take the kids over Father's Day weekend. After a great time together, they got word Zoe and Tyler would soon be sent to an orphanage. The state had called us that we're going to come get them. So immediately everybody went to jumping and saying, hey, can y'all can y'all keep these kids a little while while we're working something out? And we were like, yeah, we'll, we will. And it's amazing how something like that could happen. And in a couple of days, it come to fruition. And nobody, nobody knew but God, nobody did. The Abernathys went through the steps to become foster parents. Then they made a big decision. Ten months after that Father's Day weekend visit through a Zoom court date, Tyler and Zoe were adopted and officially became part of the Abernathy family. Yeah, baby! <laughs> oh, it was, it was a blast, yeah. It was, it was a, and I think the kids, they, they recognized it, you know, even, they, I don't know that they knew what Tyler says, doction. He didn't know what doction was, but exactly, but he knew that he was an Abernathy. I can't, like, remember my life before them. Like, there's no other way to describe it other than, like, they belong to us. Well, I'm thankful that God brought them into our lives because, I don't know, it's just, you know that they're here for a reason. Like, when we adopted them, that morning, you could just, like, feel it. Like, the Lord was with us, and it, you just knew it was right. The correlation between us and these children and God and all of His children, you know, I, that, I've thought of that a lot. We're all adopted in the family, and not just adopted, but we're, we're made partakers. I mean, we're, we're, we're partakers of, of, of life through Him. Tyler all the time says, thank you, Mommy, I appreciate you. He lo he thanks, thanks us for the house, everything. And it's just like to see the world through their eyes, the simple life, that's what it means. Nothing else matters. Father's Day will take on a different meaning. The fact that we, we took these children in on Father's Day, uh, the family came to, together as a whole on Father's Day last year, and it'll always be special to me, the, uh, you know, where it might not have been as special before, uh, just to know that the way God dealt with us and what He gave us and what He, uh, what he required of us, you know, all that coming together on Father's Day, uh, it, it'll be a special day from now as long as I live, for sure. What a beautiful story. And November is National Adoption Month. And I just want to personally say thank you to everyone who has been obedient to the call to adopt and foster because you are literally changing the world with that decision. All right, well, we've got some time for viewer questions. You ready? I am so ready. All right, so this one is from a viewer. She says, what Bible translation is nearest to the original Hebrew and Greek? I'm using the NLT and I love it. It was like a light being turned on for me. I was never good with literature. What are your preferences? I Gordon? love the NLT. I think it's a great translation. So if you like it, use it. Uh, we use NLT uh, as, as part of one of the source uh, translations for the English version of Superbook. We also use the New King James Version. Uh, that's one of my personal favorites. Um, there's also an um, English Contemporary Version, uh, which is, might be better for children. My father really likes the New American Standard, but he likes all of them and says they're all good. When you see the different translations and go through them, you can see the difficulty of translation. Uh, I like to go back to the original Greek. I like to go back to the original Hebrew, have a dictionary and interlineal and all of those things. I'm trying to get Ashley to do that too. <laughs> and she's, um, she's taken to it pretty well. So yeah. Good. I love it. Here's a word from Psalms. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. God sets the lonely in families.